These are American juvenile delinquents, teenage murderers, rapists, and thieves. And this is their prison. Compared to ordinary prisons, it's as free as a holiday camp. It's an experiment in reform and could be a model for the future. It's called Case 2. The experiment is with one dormitory of 28 boys at a reform school near Washington, D.C. Its approach to young criminals makes it different from any other prison in America. The strongest advocate for this prison of tomorrow is its originator and director, Harold Cohen. This is a project that deals with young adolescent males. They have been institutionalized for crimes against society. The uniqueness about this project is that we deal with the young men as young men. We do not in any way restrict them from the normal kind of reinforcement that young men have in our society, such as Playboy magazine. Some people perhaps are shocked over the fact that uh, there are young pinups with young women with, with breasts, but then again, all of America reads Playboy. And I would say this looks like any typical university dormitory. America's need for some solution to the problem of rising teenage crime is urgent. Bernard Russell, head of the U.S. Office of Juvenile Delinquency. The problem of delinquency is one that is frightening most of the country and most other Western urbanized country. We know that the delinquency rates are rising considerably every year, considerably more than the child population. In the 60s, we were faced with a convergence of a number of trends which make the situation even more alarming. For one thing, we're reaping the bumper crop of babies that started after World War II. Those babies are now becoming youths, youths who are eligible for delinquency. In addition, the stresses and strains of big city living are very hard on the family and make the traditional family controls over their children weaker uh, than we would like them to be. Aggravating this is the effect of living in slum neighborhoods. Case two social worker, Knapp Turner. This is the heart of the ghetto, a ghetto in Washington, D.C. There are 10,000 ghettos in nearly every city across this country. Places where nobody cares. Nobody cares about these people, where they've almost given up hope. As we ride by, you notice houses that are being condemned. People sitting around on stoops. This is the time of day when a man should be working. There are no jobs. You take kids out of this type of a neighborhood and you send them to the traditional type of training school or reformatory where they learn nothing. They are treated with unkind treatments and punishment. And they have to return to the same neighborhood when they're released. And so it begins and ends in an endless cycle. So the bad influence of the neighborhood adds to the bitter experience of prison and the kids wind up getting in trouble all over again. The statistics tell an increasingly grim story. In America, a serious crime is committed every 15 seconds, and one in five of these is the work of a teenager. Crime is rising at all levels, but it's rising twice as fast for youngsters as it is for adults. The result is almost 100,000 young people end up being sent to hard reform school prisons by courts like this one. On two charges, auto theft and truancy. You are committed to the Youth Development Center for an indefinite term. While there, you will participate in all of the programs of rehabilitation which will be offered you. Okay, fall on you guys. The fact is those rehabilitative procedures have not been uniformly successful. We estimate that about one third of the youths entering our correctional institutions have been there before. And this is not a rate that we're particularly proud of. The traditional reformatory is based on unrelenting discipline. The threat of punishment is everywhere. Naturally, resentment builds up. This is Edison Hall, and I have 48 boys. That's a good number. Thank you. A control center Haley coordinates Johnson, a head count, one of many made during the day at America's 274 teenage institutions. The guards must be always vigilant. This way, runaways can be spotted soon after they escape, soon enough, hopefully, to catch them. Escape attempts at an institution like this one with 300 boys can run as high as two or three a week. Well, uh, actually, it dates back to uh, 1959. Uh, that's when I started uh, stealing things. Well, I got caught several times when I got sent to an institution in North Carolina. I stayed in there for 13 days, and I ran away from there, and I stole a car, and I got caught with that, and I got sent to a, a state compound down in North Carolina. 
for punishment down there, you know, they'd, they'd take you downstairs in what they called a barber shop and bend you over a barrel and whoop your rear end with a, uh, with a razor strap. Portable 10, bye. Columbia Hall's got a count of 62. Over. Life in the traditional reform school is deliberately tough. The old view favors plenty of hard manual labor and strict routine to build good habits in bad boys. The basic incentive is punishment. In some schools, the threat of a beating, in others, a couple of days in the hole, the prisoner's word for solitary confinement. Reward incentives are few and far between. Little effort is made to re-educate the boys thinking or change their values, little beyond a gesture at helping 17-year-olds to learn how to read. We're talking about, are going to talk uh, about Trent. Trent. Do you see Trent? Yeah. Do you find him? Good. All right, well, you go on reading now. We'll find out something about Trenton. It's back on page 85. Trenton, let us now fall down the far land and view the main cities along its course. Locate them on the map on page 68. Nearest to New York is the busiest manufacturing city of Trenton. It is the capital of the state of New Jersey. And it's famous in history. On Sunday, a handful of boys marched dutifully to church. What does it mean to love? Love God, neighbor, self. Have you ever seen two boys fighting, really having a fight, steamed up and yelling at each other? Fists are flying everywhere, and along comes an older person, and the older person says, now, you naughty children, you shouldn't be fighting with each other. You should love each other, because if I love my neighbor, then I do right by him. What do we mean when we use the word love? How do you love your neighbor? You're not supposed to fall in love with all your neighbors. How do you love yourself? You surely wouldn't want to fall in love with you. What is it to love? And I'll try to put it as, as simply as I can. It is, has nothing to do with being sexually attracted to another person. Sometimes a person will use the word love. Does it just... All you're thinking about there is, you know, when you're going to get out. You know, you don't have anything to occupy your mind. Or you, just, you just keep thinking, boy, I'm going to get even with this. Was using the word. All right. If it isn't a feeling kind toward somebody, if it isn't a falling in love because you're sexually attracted to somebody, what is love? To love. This is Joe. We're down the cemetery. There's six of them. Just jump the fence. Six boys have escaped. A local police unit joins the hunt with dogs. live in a police state, therefore we should not assume that our treatment should be based upon uh, a police system which somebody else tells you how far you can go. And what this means is that a youngster is starting to put the controls back in his own behavior, his own hands. His own hands. That's the key to the kind of prison case two is. Responsibility for his own behavior is left to the boy. The incentive to behave is a reward system based on earning and spending points as if they were money. The thing that we are attempting to do is to give the individual choices, establish then uh, a sense of self-worth and judgment. And this we do through the educational program and through the fact that he now uses his funds to buy his own privacy, his own food, his own clothing, his own rights in our own environment. The process of re-education begins right after a new boy walks in the door. He's brought by guard, but at case, this kind of old-style supervision is held to a minimum. 
A tape recorder is turned on to keep a scientific record of Dennis Lamb's first experience at Case, an interview with its director. Hi, I'm Harold Cohen. Dennis Lamb. Dennis? Yes, sir. Right. Where are you from, Dennis? Asheville, North Carolina. Asheville. You're not the other two. Are you the only one from Asheville? Yes. In Case. In Case. Mm -hmm. How'd you get here? Uh, they had us down. Was put me up here on violation of probation. Violation of probation. What was the original, uh, original rap? Uh, it was two and three years ago, and then this other guy stole a bicycle off a of government property. Bicycle off a of government property? Yes, sir. Was it a good bike? Yeah, it was good. <laughs> what kind of bike was it? Swin. Oh, Swin, that's a good bike. Fine. Got good taste. Well, how did you break uh, probation? No, I just I did everything in, except what my probation officer told me. Like what? Like everything. I goofed off. When he wanted to see me, I wouldn't go up there. You showed him? Yeah, I showed him all right. Mm -hmm. I don't blame you for not liking me. But I, I, I deserve being up here. If I listened to him, I wouldn't be here. It's my own fault. I can't blame him for that. I ain't got a thing against him. Mm -hmm. Did you ever think about going off to college? I'd like to go to college, but I don't know whether we could afford it or not. My mother did. Well, you know, you're right in the whole complex of a large triangle of colleges. North Carolina's got lots of colleges. Hmm? It's right around there. Yeah. Need grades? No, I don't need grades. I got the grades. Mm -hmm. I don't need, need money? That's the money problem. Well, let's see. If you work real hard for five months, Put away some dough, you can save yourself five, six hundred bucks. That would be a help, wouldn't it? It'd be a big help. Sure would. Well, that's one of the things you can do. They don't feed you well here? Yeah, they feed me well. Just like chewing on nails? Yeah, I'm nervous. <laughs> you're nervous? What you nervous about? Everything in general. My mother and father. They're getting old now. I don't know, I just worry about them all. How old are they? My father's 65, my mother's 62. Mm -hmm. Are you the youngest in the family? Yes, sir. Beside my foster sister. Well, I'm, uh, I'm sure that you'll work out well. And, uh, I think that when we look at the test, I'll take a look and see where you stand, and see what, what is possible. After this, Lamb finds out how Case 2's point system works from bookkeeper Joan Cohen. You're Dennis Lamb? Yes, ma'am. I'm Joan Cohen. Uh, this particular area it will be known as data control and banking to you in the future. Um, as you know, your earnings are worth one cent a point. And all of your points will be earned on the educational programs from upstairs. For instance, you may take an arithmetic program that will earn you, oh, let's say, 100 points a unit. This means that in a, in a given day, you could earn up to six or seven dollars very easily, or more, depending on how you pace your work. Uh, this will be placed on your payroll sheet and on your card as a matter of record on Friday. You are then free to spend those points for any items you want to purchase, personal items such as toiletries and uh, cigarettes. Lamb's soap and toothbrush are free. From now on, he'll pay for all his needs and privileges with the points he earns studying. If he doesn't study, he gets no points. If he's uncooperative, he's fined so many points. Solvency and its comforts are up to him, and this is how it is in the real world, too. The discomforts of being poor are case two's only punishments, but they're usually enough. Above all, the boys are here to learn. This, of course, is the school. It doesn't look like a school. It resembles more an industry. And in a sense, the way we call it, it is an industry. And the industry is brain power. That's what we produce here. And that's our important product. And on the basis of that product, and the youngsters produce this product for us, they get paid. And the payment is based upon being 90% correct in all their exams and all their work. We do not pay off for anything less than 90%. The youngsters come in, they're called student educational researchers. And they come in, they punch into work. They can work as long as they like, or as little as they like. Each individual is on his own program, based upon his own background. Every boy then studies at his own speed using self-instruction courses. Right answers on tests earn the highest number of points. 
two faults, three true, four faults, five faults, six true, seven faults, eight true, nine adjective, ten pronoun, eleven adverb, twelve preposition, thirteen pronoun, fourteen verb, fifteen adverb. Uh, that's a concentration that does not. You made an 86% on this, so we corrected you verbally to a 91. And on 2200 post-test, there's a possible 332 points and 91% of that is 302. Very good. Thank you. That's the equivalent of a pack of cigarettes. A good payoff for two hours' work. The positive reinforcement system is that we pay off when you are right in terms of points. And also the other payoff is that being right is in itself a reinforcer. Nobody wants to be wrong. I mean, I've gone around a very short time, but I haven't found anybody who enjoys being wrong. Well, I've, I've been in uh, case two ever since November the 20th. And I've learned more since I've been in case than I learned all the rest of the years I went to school on, on the streets out there. I can pick up a ninth grade and run through a ninth grade science book, you know, just like it was nothing. After studying, the boys can relax and spend the points they've earned. Yeah, uh, I had uh, $45 put in the banks. You see, in the bank downstairs, we have a banking system, you know, where they can take a certain, where uh, you can tell them to take a certain amount of points off your paycheck, and uh, which which they'll do, and it'll be put in the bank downstairs. And whenever you want it, you can take it out. You know, you're doing it because you want to get points. You know, to buy buy sodas and crackers and all this stuff, and go to lunch and have some fun in it. It's like uh, playing pool and ping pong and stuff. And uh, also for listening purposes, uh, you know, for the jukebox downstairs. The boys practice for a dance, the first to be held outside the prison. Clearly the boys like it at case two, but how do others feel about it? It has its critics. Some complain about its lack of discipline. Others think the incentive of money is wrong. Prison chaplain, Father Tuey. And this is the thing I wonder a little bit about. If for instance, the philosophy is something like anybody can be had if the price is right. Anybody can be bought. You can do anything with money. Then it seems to me that quite possibly the boys are being promoted, are being stimulated to take a position of great ambition, but the ambition is for money. Now, they might say to me, they might say to anybody, this is only the real world. The world is a world which tries to promote the ambition for money. Well, this is all well and good, except we are not very happy with the real world as we see it today. There are things wrong with it. We can see in America today, so many of the problems are precisely because people have been filled with this ambition for money. Cohen doesn't worry about critics. At a dance outside the prison, his boys enjoy a night of freedom. They've earned it with case two money, and Cohen feels this is right. this afternoon. Uh, the mother seems to be a uh, pretty solid type. Uh, Social worker Nap Turner she, talks about she, Joe Nathan, a case two graduate. How boys like him do on the outside is the real test of whether Cohen's system works. Joe has many problems, among them an unstable family situation. Keeping in close touch with him is vital to helping him succeed. Mm -hmm. 
I saw an article in the paper the other day, Joe, that mm -hmm. you might be interested in. How are you doing on your job? All right. Good? Very well. Good. good, that's good. I saw an article about a training program mm -hmm. uh, for bricklayers, apprentices. Uh -huh. And uh, it's for boys from 18 to 21. And due to your background and things that you learned at Case, I think this would be a good follow-up for you. You know, you know you're good with working with your hands. Mm -hmm. Tell me, how, how are you doing with your boys around these days? Well, things are going fairly well. Uh, most of the boys, like I said, oh, I dropped my phone. Thank, thank you very much. Most of the boys, like, like Joe, are, you know, working and planning on going back to school. Uh, of course, you know, we always have some problems. Some parents pampering kids a little too much, like, you know, and others, uh, like you and Mr., like you and your wife, who are giving, you know, Joe the proper type of guidance. Joe comes from a very nice, a very nice family, you know, uh, close-knit family situation. And uh, although I've never asked him, uh, Joe, uh, the things that caused you to get into trouble before, uh, did you learn anything in the case that helped you to, like, uh, Stay out of trouble. You find out anything about yourself? Which is, you know, just how just how did case affect you? Well, it affected me. Uh, it made, you know, it, it was. You always had something to do. I always found out there was something always to do besides getting in trouble, like read books and, um, you know, study, um, doing homework and everything. I always found something else to do more than stay out of trouble. Mm -hmm. Found it much different than being in the regular schools, too, didn't um, you? Yes, uh -huh. sir. It gave him a little more ambition about school, too. I think that uh, where he had become slack, you know, in uh, schoolwork, and I, I do, I think really that it kind of brought out something. Uh, a little more ambition to go back and learn something. He found out that there was a little more to learn out there. It's extremely tough for a, a kid. When he's back, he's right back on the corner, the same old neighborhood, the same thing happening over and over again. His associations have really changed, you know. Although we have changed Joe Nathan, you know, what about his associates? You see, he's thrown back into a situation that, you know, could very well be a, a reverse of the learning process. How are things doing a job, Joe? Yeah, he's doing all right. He's case two, a model for the prison of tomorrow. Harold Cohen. Well, it's much too early to make you know, long-range predictions about the success and the behavioral change of the students. However, uh, so far, the young men are all out. Uh, they've taken areas of responsibility where they had none before. Another thing, you know, if you... There is a, a new sense of, of pride of accomplishment. People are saying a job. You couldn't hold a job before. Yeah, we have about four or five gone back to school. Some young men have gone back and actually taken responsibility for the family. Uh, they seem to enjoy responsibility where before they were shying away from it. We're rather encouraged. And here's a letter from a young man from Middlesex, North Carolina. And uh, he writes, uh, thank you for your letter of concern and for letting me know in the progress of the school work at Jefferson Hall. I'm so pleased for the students. I was sorry too that I didn't get to see you before I left for home. My family and I really were overjoyed that I could be home for Christmas. Notice the language. We had a perfect holiday. Hope yours was just the same. My wife and I are the proud parents of a baby girl. She was born April 7th, 1966, and weighed seven pounds, two ounces. We named her Deborah Ann. Things are going along just fine. Tell the case staff and the boys hello and my best regards. Yours truly, Gerald Hamilton. These are the kinds of uh, letters, of course, which are quite literate and uh, quite reinforcing to us. The experiment is still very much an experiment, but it looks promising. The US Bureau of Prisons, which helps to support it, is interested now in trying the method at other prisons. As for Cohen, he's cautious in his hopes. He knows the road will be hard for all case graduates. I mean, we cannot change the American scene, and it's a difficult struggle. And I would be foolish to state that uh, what we've done here will permit them to make that breakthrough. But uh, I think it's, uh, it's going to help them.